Hello, good evening. You're all very welcome. I'm Ruth Hegarty and you're very welcome to the first Fortnight Festival and to our event tonight, Change Minds, Archives, Art and Mental Health. We've got a terrific panel, just the right people to introduce you to this Change Minds project. We have Gary Tuckson, who's the Norfolk County Archivist and also currently chair of the Archives for Wellbeing Network. And he'll be joined by Laura Drysdale, who's the Director of Restoration Trust, which led on the establishment of the Change Minds project. And then we're very lucky to have Richard Johnson, who was a participant in the project and is the research coordinator for Dr. Hill's Casebook. Their discussion is going to explore the impact, legacy and transformative potential of Change Minds for people living with mental health conditions. So Gary is going to speak first, then he'll hand over to Laura and then on to Richard. And there'll be plenty of time at the end to ask questions. And if any occur to you as you're listening, you can put them into the Q&A section, which you'll find on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And this event is being recorded, as you'll have seen when you signed up for this. Uh, so if you do not wish your name to be um, reproduced, just make sure that um, you, you say that in your question when you put it in, which will be seen by me and the panelists. Now this event is being run by Grange Gorman Histories and I want to make a few remarks about that as it's a relatively new project still. It's a public history project of Dublin City Council, the Grange Gorman Development Agency, the HSC, local communities, the National Archives, the Royal Irish Academy and the new Technological University Dublin which is in the process of moving students in to the shared campus. Our planned programme is being led by the GDA and the RIA to lead this public history project of research and discovery, including the treatment of mental illness on the site since the 19th century. The programme includes events, exhibitions, a professionally run oral history project. It also includes a book which we are going to publish at the Royal Irish Academy. Um, I run their publishing house. And the book is written by psychiatrist Professor Brendan Kelly, and I'm indebted to him um, for preparing for this event. His work is tremendous in this area. The working group for Grange Gorman Histories is chaired by Dr. Philip Cohen, and that group has been appointed to devise and realise the programme over the next couple of years. All of the details of our programme are in the, the foundation document, which is published on our website grangegormanhistories.ie. So if you'd like to get involved, if you'd like to attend events or find out more, just go over to the site and have a look. In the past 250 years, Grange Gorman on the north side of Dublin has been the site of a prison, workhouse and a very well-known mental hospital. In 1810, government finances were made available to build a public asylum to be named the Richmond Asylum in honour of the Duke of Ris Richmond, who was Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. This was partly to relieve pressure on the houses of industry, the workhouses, charitable institutions that offered relief and accommodation to the destitute. The architect was Francis Johnson, who many people will know as the designer um, of the General Post Office, the GPO. And the plan for the Grange Gorman Asylum was similar to that of Bethlehem Asylum in England. Excellent records were kept from the earliest times and this complete record running continuously from 1814 is now restored and housed in our National Archives in Dublin. An important aspect of the Grange Gorman Histories project is to properly open up the archives and mental health records to researchers and those seeking to understand their family history. We're hoping that protocols can be arranged to provide access by the HSE to records not just from Grange Gorman but all other surviving archives of mental institutions in this country. There are multiple histories to explore with the capacity to focus via the archives on the individual's lives as they were lived. And it'll, of course, allow us to enhance our understanding and knowledge of mental and psychiatric treatments, social history, and the pivotal in role these institutions played in our lives. How you were admitted, what treatment was like, how life within the asylum was like, what you ate and what the experience was like for the staff will all be possible to discern from the archives. 
We'll be able to understand the evolution of the hospital from the Richmond Asylum as it was established, how it expanded rapidly with tens of thousands of people admitted from all over Ireland. Um, and we'll see it's, it change its name from that to the Richmond District Lunatic Asylum in 1830, Grange Gorman Mental Hospital in 1925, and St. Brendan's Hospital in 1958. And to many people, it was known simply as Grange Gorman. We'd like to um, use this access to the archives to be an adaptation, to, to, to develop an adaptation of this wonderful Change Minds project, which has been run in the UK. And uh, this is the time to introduce our very patient panel. And I'm going to hand over now to Gary. Gary, I'd like to hand over to you to take it from there. Okay, thank you, Ruth. I thank will you. share my screen. And hopefully now you're all seeing my slideshow. With, three, with our three names on there. <laughs> right, so um, I, I'm going to take the first part of this evening and then I'll be handing over to my two colleagues and you can see our names over there. Oops, first mistake. Right, so the first thing is probably worth saying is what Change Minds is really there to do. Because sometimes when you're involved in a project, um, it's easy to forget what the real core of what you're about is. And basically change minds, which we always bear in mind, is helping in the recovery of people living with mental health conditions. And that's that's the that's the reason change minds exist. It is a mental health well-being project. Now change minds started, I think it was probably about five years ago now when I first met Laura and we started discussing change minds. And one of the things which is at the core of change minds are the archives. Um, in our case, we use the records of Fort St Andrew's Hospital in uh, Norwich. And within that collection are these series of case books. Now, these case books are actually fairly common survivals. I've worked in, I think, five record offices in England and Wales, and every single one of those had similar records. And th these, are, these are superb records. I'm just going to run through one of them in a, in a second to show you what they are. But there are literally thousands and thousands of cases in these books. They date from the early 19th century, coming right the way through. Obviously, the more recent you get, um, you, you hit closure periods. But for the period which we're looking, the 1880s, all these records are open, they're all accessible. Um, and they are, I think what makes them really special is they are really instantly accessible to people. The empathy which you can feel straight away is hugely enhanced by the fact they have got photographs of people. So often when you're dealing Gary, with our... Yes. Gary, do you mind if I interrupt you there? Just can you hit run slideshow on yours and we'll be able to see them a little bigger? Ah, uh, right. Have you... I think... If you go up because... to the slideshow at the top and hit run. Yeah, no, it's, it's showing as a slideshow on my screen, but it's not showing as a slideshow on your screen, I think. Okay, well, not to worry. It's big enough. Now, what I can do is, if it's big enough, I can do that. Okay, if I, if I leave it as it is, yeah, because otherwise I'll be, I'll have to unshare the screen. Um, but I can make it. Sure, no larger. problem. That's fine. Fire ahead. There we go. That's a bit bigger, isn't it? Um, so what I've done is I've just taken one of the cases. And I just extracted some parts of the page rather than a huge block of text to see in front of you. And as you can see that from the number in the top left of the screen, you know, this is the 877 case in one of the many books we have. And it lays out the details of the people. This chap is um, a Thomas Butler, um, gives you his age, tells you what his occupation was, where he lived, um, and has got information about his previous history. This one's fairly brief. Um, what this gives for people who are taking part in the 12 sessions of Change Minds is a lot of information about who this person actually is, so they can engage in research. Each of the participants in Change Minds selects one of these cases from the books, and that becomes the subject of their research. Then over the course of the first part, we teach them research skills. 
you know, some of them are fairly basic family history research skills. One of the things which we do, we like about the 1880s, is the fact that they fit really well with things like census returns. So instantly you can start finding out things about this person's life. Now, the selection of the cases is done, um, everybody who takes part doesn't get issued a case to research, they get to choose. And it may be lots and lots of different reasons why people will choose a case. Um, this one was actually used before. I, th I think it's just it took the interest. And sometimes it's just as simple as people connect with the photograph of the people. Um, so as you can say, we've got this basic information, which is a great way of launching the research. We have a block of text which describes their condition and their previous history just before coming into hospital. So this is describing how this person had had a, a, an attack three months before, become uh, been admitted to the asylum. This one, I think, was chosen by somebody because he had gone to New York. He'd been to America. Um, he'd been detained there in an asylum for three months um, and afterwards sailed back and reached Norwich a few days ago. Um, interestingly, this person thought that um, he was being chased by Fenians. He had this sort of like um, persecution. Um, there's a big block of information which follows this, which details their actual stay in the hospital and um, monthly periodic reports on the condition. But then what makes these, and this is something which I don't haven't come across in all of the um, books I've seen before, but it actually has a photograph on discharge as well. So part of what we do in the selection of cases, we make sure that this is somebody who you know, has a positive outcome because we want the research to cover before they go into the hospital and after they, come, they go leave the hospital. Interesting to note, one of the things which people always notice in these cases is if we just flick back to when he was admitted to the hospital, you can see he's got a weight of 10 stone. When he leaves the hospital, we can see his weight is... 11 stone four pounds and virtually every single case you find in the hospital people have put on weight um, it's part of that cure and being well fed but it's one of, the, one of those things which um, comes up almost every time so the way we structure the course is we start off with a period of research um, so say everybody selects a case who becomes their subject, the object of their research. They learn some skills and they look into that person's life. Um, the first session is looking at the archive as a whole and uh, having a tour around the record office. One of the things we found is actually the, the building itself, and what goes on there is fascinating. You know, it's very easy for me to be sort of blase about it because I, well, not recently, but usually I'm there virtually every day. Um, but that, that's one of the things we underestimated was the impact of being in the building, which, which it has. Um, the second session, we start with a bit of paleography, a bit of reading out handwriting, because quite often when you look at a 19th century hand, um, you know, some people will think, oh, that's difficult to read. Very quickly, people build up confidence. We tend to do a sort of group reading session and people take the odd word and learn that way. Then they do the selection of cases. And then for the next couple of weeks, there is a series of research based sessions. So there's how to use the search room, you know, how to get the best out of the archives, how to use online resources, they get support in the actual research they're doing. So they can build up more and more information about the people. We then move on to a, a second set of sessions, which is the creative side of it. And during that creative side, we, um, we've engaged with lots of um, creative facilitators and they've done a variety of things. People have done art, people have done poetry, people have, um, done um they, they've stitched they've done needlework um and we've also done work on recording oral histories where people reflect on their case reflect on their own histories as well and that helps create a, a permanent record within the archive as well next slide i don't know if you'll see it very well at the end of the project we always have um, a celebration, uh, you know, something to mark the end of the 12 weeks which they, which um, people have um, taken part in. 
one of the things which we've done in the first two iterations of Change Minds is we actually staged quite a significant exhibition. We took over the foyer of the Millennium Library in Norwich, which is an incredibly busy library. And these are a couple of the um, posters which went up as part of that, which is based on the research which people did as part of the course. Um, the exhibition was incredibly successful. Um, we had thousands of visitors basically it was there for, for a week um, huge amount of interest in the, in the project um, this lady here um, was particularly popular with me because she was a participant on the course and um, she managed to get someone to donate a barrel of beer for the opening which i thought was very very good <laughs> very much appreciated and you can see this is one of the the um, activities which was undertaken so we worked with a an artist called nora gaston who um, helped with, the, with collages and paintings and people produce sort of concertinas where they were reflecting on their own experiences and the research they had done and bringing the two together. Um, this um, is a poem which one of the participants wrote. Um, there was a workshop where they worked with another with a poetry facilitator and everybody created their own poetry. What was really um, good about that was lots of people had never done anything like this before had never put anything into verse before and, and this one is one which i keep on coming back to because i think it's particularly powerful and i thought i'd read it to you so it's called flora which is the name of this lady here and the participant who wrote this was attracted to this case in the first place because the flora was in the hospital but she was a seamstress uh, this person did her own dressmaking so there was that connection in the choice of the case and the poem reads a few days after flora's marriage she became very unnatural in her manner her husband has not since been heard of through necrosis she is rotting from her roots she has saved people in her night ramblings was going to be married again i'm fixed to the earth by needles fixed to the earth by ben the vaccine there is sky and the damp give her the ground Flora has a mouthful of needles. She is making dresses in the blue shape of us. In the spring, we'll stand, face the low sun and the breeze, promenade ourselves home. I think that's a superb poem, but it really brings together what this person has done, taking part in change, minds of the research they've done and their own experiences. And I think that's one of the strengths of the project is that we're looking at uh, real stories people who've not been researched before these original things and bringing that together with people's own experiences now to say something i'll finish off just saying something about how change minds really works because at the core of change minds is the idea of partnership between bringing lots of different people together lots of different groups together who all have their own special part to bring to it so on the left, we've worked with lots and lots of um, different groups. Over there. I should always mention the Heritage Lottery Fund who paid for a couple of these courses because they always like to be mentioned, the funders. Um, and we've also worked in setting up with um, cons consultative groups like the uh, Inspire, which is a service user consultation group. We worked with the University of East Anglia as well. And Laura will talk more about evaluation later on, I'm sure. But one of the big things in Change Minds we want to do is show it works. And having the right people taking part in that valuation as a partner was really important. But the three really important part partners which make Change Minds special, I think, is a sort of tripartite partnership where we've got the Norfolk Record Office um, or another archives in our plans for the future, you know, somebody who's got similar collections. But obviously we've got the collections. We've got those fantastic documents. We've got the facilities and we've got expertise you know we have got the historical expertise we have got the paleography expertise um, but we if we try to run change minds by ourselves we would fail because what we don't have is one we don't have the expertise expertise in delivering this sort of um as i'm sure we'll say again cultural therapy um and we don't have the connections with the um with the services who we want to work with which is our third partner where we work with mental health service providers because change minds isn't a cheap program to run 
you know, it's, it's not hugely expensive, but we um, have a project coordinator we have to pay for. We have various resources we have to pay for. Part of what we've been doing with Change Minds is paying for transport for people to attend when it's been on site as well. So, we, you know, there, there is a significant investment in this. So what we want to really make sure is that Change Minds is aimed at the people who are going to benefit the most. So a really, really important third partner is working with that service provider. In the first iterations of Change Minds, we were working with Together for Mental Wellbeing. And we were working, um, they were recruiting to the course, and the people attending were clients who they were supporting. So it was really directing at people who would benefit. So, so that, 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 that tripartite partnership is incredibly important for making sure that Change Minds hits where it needs to. Um, that's my little piece. I'm going to hand over to Laura now, who's going to obviously tell you some more about the project. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen and pass over to Laura. There we go. Hello, everybody. Um, can you hear me okay? So I'm going to yes, start. Can you no problem? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Ruth. Um, so thanks, Gary, and uh, so hello, everybody. Um, I'm Laura Drysdale, and I'm director of the Restoration Trust, and we're a charity that involves people with serious mental health challenges in heritage and creativity, and we call it culture therapy. So my backdrop is a digital reconstruction of Norfolk County Asylum by somebody who was a Change Minds participant. So Change Minds is one of our programmes and it aligns with our principles. And some of those are that group work is core, that we believe in sustained and regular involvement. We like real heritage, real expertise and real creativity and we measure what matters. So we're lucky to work with Gary and I'll tell you a bit more about how that happened because my feeling is that in life you need people who say yes. So in 2014 I was working for the organisation he referred to together and that was all with people who had serious mental health challenges. And I noticed that many of the clients had interests that services ignored because they were preoccupied with people's basic needs. But actually conversation about family history or knitting or motorbikes, or whatever really, made a relationship. And without that relationship, you couldn't help with the basics. So an idea emerged about clients recording oral histories about their experience of the mental health system. It was something interesting to do a way to affirm people's right to a voice. This was when we were in austerity and welfare reform was really hitting people hard. And it was also a contribution to the future. So I met Gary and he immediately suggested using the Norfolk County Asylum records as a way to link people's contemporary experiences at the sharp end with local history. And we were lucky too it was the zeitgeist that the National Lottery Heritage Fund was being proactive about social justice and well-being. And so they funded our first two Norfolk projects and now our current project, Dr. Hill's Casebook. So I think Gary's shown you, but I'm going to ex explore a bit more, how archives are an incredibly rich resource for well-being. So they're largely free to use. They're often publicly owned. They're available everywhere, physically and online. I mean by everywhere in all areas where there were asylums. And they've got a culture of accessibility, so they're inherently inclusive. Record offices as physical spaces are, once you've got over the initial barriers, they're very safe places. They're orderly and comfortable. This thing about having essentially the same records in different places means that you can scale up. So a project like Change Minds can be rolled out at somewhere like Grange Gorman, for instance, 
and that's sustainable and cost effective. Digitization and family history websites are a vital layer of usability because digital exclusion is a threat to well-being. Um, I think we've really found that during COVID. And the urge to discover information encourages people to overcome their fear of that online space. Well, as for archivists themselves, um, I'm a pretty big fan. By chance, David Olashoga, the historian, said something wonderful about archives on BBC Radio 4's Desert Island Discs this morning. I really urge you to listen to it if you haven't already heard it. He said, there's nothing like opening a document and seeing the signatures, the names of people who are just as real as actual as we are. And these documents are often the turning point, the cornerstone in their lives. Did they live? Did they die? Did their child live or die? Were they ruined or did they become wealthy? That spin of the dial moment with a document can be immensely powerful. If documents are powerful, then asylum records are superpowers. <laughs> You've seen that many have these admission and discharge photographs. Even without photographs, they compel empathy especially when they echo personal experience. So Gary described how the Change Minds, the 12 sessions broadly break down, but I'm gonna start by talking about the research element. So say you choose a case from the records about someone called Margaret. Um, you can find out a lot about Margaret because perhaps she, like you, lived in Dublin, um, and perhaps she had postnatal depression, something maybe you can identify with. Maybe she had two children. Maybe you can find out something about their lives from family history research. So you meet Margaret and you connect with her across time. You have evidence to keep you in touch with reality. And Margaret was an actual person, as actual as you are. So there's a relationship there between you and Margaret. Um, it's an object relationship, as psychoanalysts would say. So we can't be another person, but we can connect with them, whether they're in the room, they're online, or they're in a document. Now, research is frustrating. So there'll always be this gap, um, information you can't find out, or the trail just runs dry. And you can bear the frustrations of research because you can fill in those gaps by imagining Margaret. Imagination lies in the space between us in what Winnicott called potential space. So that's a place where we're playful and curious and where frustration can be tolerated and thought can thrive. It's the place of health. But people with serious mental illness suffer an attack on that potential space, which gets filled up by rumination or psychosis, or it gets shut down by depression's bleakness. Serious mental illness makes real and metaphorical space treacherous so that you can't cross it to connect with others. So if you don't have that space to think or act, nothing creative can happen. There can't be any imagination or any relating. That's why the creative sessions in Change Minds are important. I think because they respond to the connections that people have made during research, and it's a way to expand that space, our inner landscape. And one person, who was part of an online change mind, minds run by the Museum of the Mind, the Bethlehem Museum of the Mind during the spring lockdown said, I was dubious initially about the creative aspect of the project. However, not only did I have the opportunity to try something totally outside of my comfort zone, but I realized that the investigative part of the process had left me with feelings and emotions that I was able to travel, tra channel into the creative work. 
And I feel this was an essential part of the project for me as I've been able to have closure on my patient. I said that group work is a core principle for us and we've begun to think of our groups as a kind of therapeutic community. People who come on our projects are often members of what you might call an anti-community of those who struggle to belong and that can really damage your health. So one Change Minds member didn't speak to anyone she knew from when sessions stopped for Christmas, so until they started again after Christmas. So that was from mid-December until mid-January. You have to be really strong to survive that. People may also have lived in malign communities, such as an abusive family. In evaluation, one person on our Human Henge project, which we run at Stonehenge, said, you can get trapped in making the world so small and protecting yourself from the world. And she went on more hopefully, some things you don't need protecting from. Sometimes I think it's just slowly breaking down barriers. And this is a start, you know, within these groups. So I think that there's a red thread that runs from the therapeutic optimism that persisted in some late 19th century asylums like Norfolk County Asylum through the wartime Northfield experiments about managing groups and forward to our groups at the Restoration Trust. So Northfield Hospital in Birmingham was a second World War military hospital converted from an annex to a lo the Rubri Lunatic Asylum. And servicemen were sent there for psychological rehabilitation. And the experiments were about how groups manage themselves, how they can, yes, run themselves, really. Although pretty short-lived, the Northfield experiments were the basis for group psychotherapy and for the therapeutic community movement. I think they were part of a sort of post-war impulse towards groups and away from individualism, like communes in the 60s. Some therapeutic communities were as small as families and actually often as dysfunctional as families, but others encompassed whole hospitals like under medical superintendent David Clark at Fullbourne Hospital in Cambridge from 1953. Actually, David Clark sounds quite like Dr. Hills of whom you'll hear from Richard. Barbara Taylor in her fantastic book called The Last Asylum describes leaving Free and Barnet, a vast asylum in North London. It's the asylum with, I think it's the one with the longest corridors um, in Europe. So she left Free and just as it was closing in the early 1990s, and she was discharged to a day hospital, which was run on therapeutic community lines. So we can follow the thread from the asylum to therapeutic communities and to day hospitals. Most day hospitals in England have gone now, but one of our members described the Restoration Trust role as providing the day hospitals of the future. Once people can feel safe enough to be members of a group with all the risks of love and loss that that entails, they're a community. And when you add to that the confidence to move fluidly across time, deploying new skills, people are set up to connect with other benign communities that they can contribute to and draw on. So I hope we are a kind of therapeutic community. So we're in hard times. There are so many forces driving us apart that we need to use all our resources, including heritage, to bring us together. Archives are amazing but they're not part of the mainstream conversation about culture and health. Our evaluation consultant on Dr. Hill's casebook, um, Professor Karen McArdle, couldn't find a single publication in her literature search that explicitly evidenced the use of archives for health and well-being, although we know there are good projects out there. So we're developing Change Minds projects and partnerships. Thank you, Ruth.
online, on site and mixtures of the two. We need more projects and significant evidence to make the case that excellent, careful, fascinating, creative experiences of archives result in deep inclusion and better mental health. So that's my call to action. These records matter to history because they speak directly to us about the lives of ordinary people. It's enough to research them for their own sake, but to mobilise them for mental health, that's a really decent thing to do. Over to you, Richard. Uh, my name is Richard Johnson. I'm the research coordinator for Dr. Hill's casebook. Um, as Laura said, uh, the Dr. Hill's casebook follows on from the series of Change Minds projects, projects which are specifically aimed at participants with mental mental health. I joined Change Minds in 2018, having had a succession of periods of uh, mental ill health. Um, and we are fortunate in Norfolk that we have such a large collection of asylum records, both in volume and variety. The jewels in the crown are the, are the patient casebooks and the journals of Dr. William Hills, the medical superintendent of the asylum from 1861 to 1887. My first reading of Dr. Hill's journal was like the metaphorical bolt of lightning. He wrote with good humour and further digging revealed a, a man of very real concern for his patients. Hardworking and possessed of a genuine humanity. John Colony, the proponent of non-restraining lunatic asylums during the 19th century and himself a medical superintendent, wrote in 1847, the medical superintendent will almost regard his patients as his children and humanly speaking, his whole heart will be given to them. That's him, that's Dr. Hills. From his medical training at Guy's Hospital, his period at the Surrey Dispensary and 33 years in pauper asylums, Dr. Hills devoted his life to the medical care of the poor. And other more prominent practitioners were quick to seek the, the money and fame of private practice. Dr. Hills was certainly not lacking in ability. After qualified in as both a surgeon and a doctor of medicine, he was appointed medical superintendent of the Norfolk County Asylum in 1861. For over 25 years, he cared for the patients, managed the staff, and administered the general running of the institution. His journals and the annual reports demonstrate his personal ethos and the heavy burden of responsibility of caring for over 700 patients with only one or two medical assistants. Since then, over two years ago, my world has consisted of Dr. Hills and the patients and the staff of the asylum. I've laughed with them, cried with them and rejoiced at their successes. They are family and friends. It was with surprise, with not a little personal satisfaction, that Laura Drysdale of the Restoration Trust proposed a project to be based upon my research of Dr. Hills and the asylum, Dr. Hills Casebook. Dr. Hills Casebook uses the same principles behind Change Minds, but with the specific aim of producing a piece of community theatre about life at the asylum during Dr. Hill's leadership. The primary aim is to stimulate public conversation comparing past and present treatment of mental illness. Engagement and enthusiasm of the research participants and the theatre element has been spectacular and has fulfilled my wildest dreams of bringing Dr. Hills to the knowledge of a wider, wider public. Each researcher adds to that, adds to the project their empathy for people over a hundred years ago, their considered examination of the asylum records and the special contribution that they bring from their own experience of mental ill health. The beauty of Dr. Hill's casebook is that people who would not otherwise access primary sources, and I include myself in this, are engaging with archival records. Such heritage projects encourage a diversity of views and knowledge which allows the community as a whole to access and discover its own history in ways which perhaps could not be achieved through more formal ad academic channels. It allows the telling of stories of people who are often ignored. It is projects like these that so clearly demonstrate that access to historical sources should never be restricted. The last two years, two and a half years, have been an exhilarating mixture of search and discovery and the revelation of stories long hidden. Who knew the history of lunacy could be so fascinating? I should with justice mention at this point the, the gold mine of Victorian lunacy records, which is the Internet Archive. My special thanks, of course, to Laura and the Restoration Trust and to the National Lottery 
heritage funds are having the confidence to finance these projects. But thanks also to Gary and the staff at the Norfolk Record Office. Gary's enthusiasm, constant good humour and encouragement has been invaluable in these projects. Without his support, we could not have achieved our success, whether on a personal basis, a project level, or in the wider field of community participation. A perfect merger of heritage, well-being, and belonging. To the general deficiency in the current mental health services, particularly in Norfolk, that cries out for such initiatives as Change Minds and the other projects provided by the Restoration Trust. Without doubt, doubt, Change Minds was and is the single most important factor in my journey of recovery. It is no exaggeration to say that it is not only life-changing, but life-saving. I wish Graham Gorman history is the very best with its plans. Who knows, perhaps Dr. J. Joseph Lawler will be your Dr. Hills. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. That was fantastic. And thank you, Laura. Thank you, Gary. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, and I have a really good, strong sense of it. It's fantastic to get you to see us through all of it and, and how it works. And I want to get on to the personal story. I know there are lots of people in the audience now who are involved or who have expertise or, or just even might have a general question. So please put something in the Q&A if you, if you have a question there. Gary, can I ask you about access to the archives and choosing them? Um, is it anything over 100 years that you can allow access to or how do you how do you do that? Yeah. Well, one of the things we had to do at the start of the project was I had to sort out the access requirements because um, there was a um, historical arrangement where they were closed for 100 years after the death of the patient. And the first okay. thing I had to do was approach the uh, Foundation Trust and discuss with them changing those arrangements because it seemed stupid that these records weren't accessible you know that we wanted to do something really important with them um, you know it just in general people should have access to records um, obviously there are reasons why people don't but we, we were in a situation where people who um, had been in the first world war there was no access to those records people who had been dead for 98 years and had died at the age of 90 so yes. what we work on the basis of really is as a rule of thumb you know, there are, there are various connotations, but we, we assume that people live for 100 years. So the records tend to be open when somebody is more than, would have been more than 100 years old. Um, so you know, that, that's a sort of... So, so, so sorry, we, we, if somebody... We, for we example, assume that somebody... people live for 100 years, and then we add a chunk of time on the end of that, basically. So the records are open till... The records are open for... Uh, I can't remember the exact date we have them open. But they are open up around to, 90, around 1920 or something. We're, we're up to the 20s now. We're, we're yeah, up you're up to the 20s. 20s. Yeah. Yeah. So anything before that? Um, you, you... Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. And have you had any problems with that ever? Has anyone ever come to you with a, a problem? I, I know that that you know there can be a, a phrase in the legislation or or the recommendations that it shouldn't cause distress to some a living or a living relative. Yeah, well, I, I, that's why the, the time lapse is in there. So yeah, that, yeah, and you've you said know, no issues. And it doesn't. You know, and, and they're, they're, you know, I suppose they're, they're up potential. But what, one of the things which um, I think you can be, one of the conversations I had actually was quite interesting with some professional staff who, my argument was that these records are, we should be treated exactly the same as we treat closure periods on other medical records. Yeah. They said to me, but surely they're, they're, they're to do with an asylum. So we should be, and I said, well, isn't that discrimination in itself? Yeah, because so. of a stigma <laughs> potentially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Are, are we perpetuating that stigma by adopting that attitude towards these records in the first place? So okay. I was really keen not to make a special case for them. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I mean, sometimes people's instincts would be too, but we're all, you know, in the process of learning not to. So. Yeah. Um, I have a question in from um, Fiona Brennan, who's a theatre historian and archivist and she works in the specialist education adult education sector and works with people with mental health difficulties and other needs so how might this work in an initiative that utilizes archives and records in other heritage areas e.g theatre and drama well i think maybe richard you you, you created a community you're creating a community theatre piece with using art yeah. using <coughs> richard Hill, yeah, or dr hill yeah, I mean, what we're doing, um, all the participants have researched their own patients. Um, they were given, we gave them a, a set of three to choose from, and they researched them. And working with the writer and actors, we, we were producing this uh, Dr. Hill's casebook, um, which is a, a play 
based on the records and uh, we just had the the, re the first script reading uh, on Wednesday and it's it's amazing um, what what uh, the writer Bill uh, has done with it um, so it's all based on the research but done by the participants um, and their their take on the on their case histories. Fantastic, yeah, and I think um, Fiona in in Grange Gorman, we're, we're we're thinking and uh, and talking about involving the School of Creative Arts, to the Technological University of Dublin TUD, um, to to create theatre pieces, and and I know that um, there's been an awful lot of work in the public art project of Grange Gorman Development Agency, where artists naturally engage with the historical archives in order to try. And, and make sense of the stories initially, mm -hmm. be able to then have their own creative response. So I, I, I think that I have an, another couple of questions coming in here, just keeping an eye on them. So oh, yes, yeah, so this is uh, actually asked by the chair of Grange Gorman Histories. He's saying current lockdown restrictions mean any project at Grange Gorman will likely be online if we get it going now in the next year or 18 months. Um, can you tell us a little bit how it could work? And then another member of the group, um, Mary Muldowney, has asked about um, this, connected to that, um, it'll have implications for our oral history collection. So she's interested in how the histories collected before the pandemic, um, how they were collected, the oral histories now of the participants in Change Minds. And has your methodology changed since lockdowns have been impl imposed? Um, so I don't know if Laura. Well, so if, if Laura does the first part about the um, online, and I'll talk about the oral histories a bit. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, during lockdown, actually, well, of course, archives are quite uh, suitable for working with online because um, that we can use digitised archives. Um, so that's fantastic. You don't, you know, you, do, you can use a digitised um, record, and then people can have that online. And actually, so what we've been able to do is we've just done what everyone else has done. We've gone on to Zoom. We've run the groups on Zoom, um, and we're very. We work with people who um, may not feel that comfortable doing that. So we've also had we've had a thing where we loan people equipment. Um, we uh, support people to um, get the training or whatever so that they can join the groups. And then, yeah, we run the groups online. We find we need to do more groups um, where we run them more often, but for shorter lengths of time. But I think people have had a pretty good experience, although, of course, they don't get that, that frisson of excitement of the real thing, you know, the real thing in your hands. Um, which is such a powerful experience. But I think it's as good as it can be, you know. And we can also morph between, uh, we're going to, we're working on this idea about having a modular approach where you can select a module which you could deliver online or, or, um, or face to face. So you could create a change minds which sort of move between the two environments. Um, in a quite flexible way. So I think although yeah. COVID is awful, it hasn't stopped yeah. our projects. Yeah, well, there it, was a great project at Bethlehem, which was just online. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really sort of helped us prompt our thinking, you know, it's, yeah. necessity is the mother of invention. But there are really the real advantages to a blended pro approach, I think. You know, w w one of the things about when we've had, one of the things people, there's been a real sort of like, high level of participation by delivering it online which is really good but as laura says you, you miss that free sort of the actual archives and the records themselves and you miss that sort of group activity although i think that has actually come about through dot hill's casebook a bit anyhow there has been that for and we have managed to do a couple of things where um, there was a visit to the asylum itself to walk around the outside and we also visited the um, local workhouse so there are outdoors activities so people could physically come together obviously with social distancing um, uh, moving on to the question about oral histories, I mean, uh, the oral history part of the project, it was something which was, um, it wasn't a huge part of the project, and it was part of that sort of creative element towards the end where if people felt comfortable with it, they could recall an oral history. So we weren't actively going out and seeking lots of oral histories to do with, to do with those experiences. Um, but what was 
really significant about it, I think, was the opportunity to, for people to tell their story and that story to be accessioned into the archive, because we've got a very large collection of saved archives, and there's a permanence to you creating something which will be kept for hundreds and hundreds of years, telling your story. So there's that continuity between as Laura was saying earlier, the gaps in the case pa in the, the, the case books, because they're very sort of like mini speak of the time, if you like, lots of them. Yeah, and they, uh, they leave so many questions unanswered, and the opportunity for people to make up for those gaps by creating a permanent oral history in the collection. W one of the regrets which I had, I mentioned about doing an exhibition, and a really successful exhibition we had at the library. It would have been great to have an oral history booth there, actually, because there were so many people coming in saying, oh, I used to work at that hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and there's so much possibilities you could have got from the stories of that, you know, something which we could do in the future, you know. I mean, Laura's talking about, mentioned the expanding change minds and how we want to roll it out further. And I think one of the things which we're really alive to is the idea that change minds, yes, we've got this core methodology and the core way we work, but there's so much you can add in. There's so many different things you can do. Um, there's potential for even using slightly different records. Um, there's potential for working with lots of different creative aspects. As I was saying, you know, there is potential for expanding that oral history element of it. So there's, there's plenty which we can do in the future. <laughs> plenty of potential, yeah. I mean, our oral history project, um, which we have going at the moment, is with retired staff. So it's recording their experience. Yeah. We have a sense that they're really important um, tales to capture um, and to archive and the, the store of knowledge that we expect to uncover there and, and record um, will be really important. Um, I, I was really interested in that idea of the red thread because in, in, in Grange Gorman, similarly to yourselves, there, there are photographs, there, there is a rich, rich um, store there to to look at, but that 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 idea of um, moral management was strong at the time, at the early early um, stages of of the asylum when it was built. And I know that um, well, it was originally a, a French doctor. I I'm no expert, but um, Jean Etienne Dominique Escurol, who who was around in the early 1800s, um, and he described moral management as the application of the faculty of intelligence and of emotions in the treatment of mental alienation. And this being a change from the past, which might have you know, emphasized care and control rather than um, the engagement with each patient as an individual. Um, and I know that in, in Grange Gorman, the idea of moral management w was very strong in, in early times and it might have involved um, it might have involved some work on the farm, but an emphasis on exercise, an emphasis on conversation. Um, and I know that um, it was maybe exercise and some light mental work, but I think Richard, that your work that you've been doing it could not be described as light mental work to keep you occupied. You sound as if you have, you know, well, yeah, I, well, it's, 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 like, it's like being in an the asylum. There's, I'm working and it's my mental health has uh, improved. God knows how. Um, and can you tell me a little bit about um, the beginning of that process? You know, you said it was like a lightning bolt when you came across. <laughs> How did that happen? Was it in a session? What, what can you describe? No, um, well, I started reading around the subject. Um, I, I got, as soon as, as soon as I started the, the project of Change Islands, um, I got hooked. So I started popping into the record office. Um, and then I just opened his journal. And the way he was writing is all dry humour, but you get you the genuine compassion for the patients. And I must admit, I mean, if it had been any other um, doctor, um, I probably we wouldn't have got, got this far, but because of who Dr. Hills was and what came out in, in his journals um, as a, a genuinely compassionate man, um, that's... that's it's, it's just it's just a dry statement he made and it just that hooked me and then yeah. I, was, I read the whole of his journals and that was um, but you've pieced together all kinds of things about like you know what christmas dinner or christmas time was like there mm. and can you describe a couple of those um because i think that's the when, when people start dive, going into the archives i think a lot of those individual ordinary stories of of daily life and yes, uh, the things like entertainment yeah, entertainments he held, he held, he held and uh, and they they went to the seaside in in summer um, on little boat trips um, and just sort of uh, 
that work was actually part of the therapy is being useful, which um, some people found a bit hard to take at first uh, as though it's a, bit, a bad thing and they've just been used or exploited. But um, that's what it is. You, you become useful again. You begin to sort of contribute and it, it just makes your mental health so um, after all the years or months or whatever of sort of uh, the bad stuff, you begin to sort yeah. of come out again. You begin to get a bit more self-confidence. You uh, you address uh, her conf- um, conferences uh, at <laughs> <not. laughs> um, <laughs> things like that. There, yeah. I think I think one particularly memorable day, which was the day when you found the first picture of Doctor Hills. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, that you know, we, we, all of a sudden we learned what he looked like, and yeah. then you found another one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, an email one. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, there can't have been that many photographs, and they were in the early in the eighteen fifties, sixties. Is it a little later? I suppose. Yeah. The seventies and eighties is is amazing. We we can find plenty of picture uh, photos for the patients. Of the staff or any other doctors, we it's, it's rare, rare as hen's teeth. Um, um, yeah. But but I think the photographs, he looked a bit. I mean, obviously everybody looks different than you expect them to. But he looked like a nice chap, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, he was the one without the gun next to the next to all the hunters, wasn't he? <laughs> yes, yeah, in the yeah. shooting party. Yeah, he's, yeah, he he didn't have his gun. <laughs> he wasn't um, shooting anybody that day. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, we are coming close to the hour, so I would like to thank you all. I would like to thank you, Gary, Laura and Richard for your time. And to all of you um, who, who came along this evening, thank you so much for coming. I hope that you'll visit GrangeGormanHistory.ie and keep an eye on what we're doing. Um, hopefully in a while you'll see an announcement of our own Change Minds program. But there's plenty there. And this um, webinar will be record is being recorded. So it will be posted up there um, early next week and we'll let you know when it's up there by email. So thank you all. Thank you all so much for, for coming. And um, we, I'm sure, we'll be in touch with you again soon.